Welcome to the fifth session of the International Symposium on Aploidentical Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation, Alpha-Beta T-cell CD19 B-cell Depleted Aploidentical Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation. We have a fantastic session on innovative pilot clinical trials with five outstanding speakers. We will have a QA session at the end of the, of the talks, and please put your questions in the chat that I can read them to the speakers. It is really a pleasure for me to introduce Agnieszka Czekowicz. Uh, Agnieszka is an assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, Stem Cell Transplantation, Regenerative Medicine, a member of the Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine and the co-PI on the platform on stem cell transplantation together with Alicia Bertina. Agnieszka has been definitely a pioneer in defining non-genotoxic conditioning regimen for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation since she was a student at Stanford. So Agnieszka, um, thank you for accepting our invitation. The title of your talk is Alpha Beta T cell CD19 B cell depleted aplodentical HSCT combined with antibody conditioning regimen for Fanconi anemia. Agnieszka. Thank you so much, Maria Grazia, and to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Today, I'll be talking about alpha beta T cell CD19 B cell depletion um, in hapoidentical stem cell transplantation combined with antibody based conditioning regimens for Fanconi anemia. And this is work that I've been working on here at Stanford Children's um, together with Dr. Rajni Agarwal, uh, Dr. Aligi Bertina, and Dr. Maria Grazia Roncarolo, amongst many others that I'll acknowledge at the end. So this is this innovative clinical trial that we're opening here at Stanford Children's. This is a US phase 1B 2A clinical trial in Fanconi anemia that was recently FDA opened, or FDA approved uh, and open. And uh, we're just now starting to screen interested patients. This trial involves uh, TCR alpha beta T cell CD19 B cell depleted grafts together with a reduced intensity preparative condition regimen containing this unique novel antibody known as JSP191 in order to try to improve and achieve engraftment of reconstitution in Fanconi anemia patients. This is a study, as I mentioned, that's a phase 1b 2a trial. So there will be three patients treated on the phase 1 portion uh, and nine patients treated on the phase 2 portion with 12 patients um, uh, in total that we anticipate treating. But prior to getting into the details uh, associated with this trial, which I'll do later on, I thought I'd first begin by ask, asking the question, um, why are we opening this trial in the first place? And I think this is really important because we believe that this trial is really the gateway to many additional trials and therapies for other patients. Our goal as a field is to really um, improve hematopoietic stem cell-based uh, therapies. And our ultimate goal is to have these therapies have 100% survival and 100% cure rates, so to no longer talk about survival curves uh, as part of our outcomes, to ensure that there are no short-term or long-term toxicities um, uh, in patients, and to really enable easier and less costly treatments. And in order to do this, we believe that there are two primary solutions that are needed in order to meet these goals. The first is the elimination of graft versus host disease triggering grafts. We believe that there are two main approaches um, uh, that are likely to dramatically improve um, uh, these concerns. And one is really the manipulation of donor allografts, which this symposium um, is based around. And we believe that these TCR alpha beta CD19 um, depleted grafts are a phenomenal way um, uh, to really reduce the GBHD or an alternative is to engineer patients' own cells that others at our institution are working at. But the other important piece is the elimination of toxic conditioning and the elimination of use of chemotherapy and radiation-based conditioning protocols, which cause massive inflammation, triggering graft-versus-host disease, as well as um, uh, leading to uh, increased infections by breaking down mucosal barriers and leading to ultimate um, uh, long-term toxicities on various different organs. Sorry, I don't know why this is uh, animating automatically, um, but I'll try to, to prevent that from doing that. Um, uh, and um, the way that we uh, hope to do this um, uh, is to use antibody-based conditioning. And our clinical trial here at Stanford Children's in Fanconi anemia, um, uh, we're using these um, uh, alpha-beta T-cell depleted grafts and this antibody-based conditioning is the first time these two um, uh, approaches will really be combined in an immunocompetent setting. So whereas we're quite excited about using this in Fanconi anemia, we're also really excited about using this approach broadly in many other disease indications to come. 
So where did this concept of antibody-based conditioning um, uh, come from? Well, it really originated um, uh, from some studies that we started doing over a decade ago when I was a trainee in Irv Weissman's lab, where we started to ask the question of what are the natural barriers to hematopoietic stem cell engraftment, and what does one really need to achieve with conditioning? There had been a variety of evidence from clinical studies that had been done in patients with immunodeficiencies that showed that some form of conditioning needed to be done in order to get high engraftment, as unconditioned immunocompromised patients still didn't get very high engraftment. And we repeated similar studies in mouse models of immunocompromised mice that were lacking B cells, T cells, and NK cells. And when we transplanted them with purified hematopoietic stem cells, we saw very similar results that was found in the clinical studies that although we could see some engraftment in this setting, it was really limited and that one couldn't get very high amounts of hematopoietic stem cell replacement um, uh, without some form of conditioning. Although we could see some engraftment, which showed us that the immune system was not um, uh, the sole barrier um, uh, and that one needed to do more. What was also very fascinating from these studies is we showed that when we transplanted more hematopoietic stem cells, on a per stem cell basis, they were actually less likely um, uh, to engraft. And also interestingly, when we transplanted purified hematopoietic stem cells with many orders of magnitude more progenitor cells, the progenitor cells didn't um, interfere with their engraftment, really showing us that likely hematopoietic stem cells compete with other um, hematopoietic stem cells, uh, and that one of the ways of potentially overcoming some of these barriers is to deplete the host hematopoietic stem cells. And that's what really led us um, uh, to develop this concept of antibody-based HSC-targeted conditioning. So rather than using current toxic methods, such as total body radiation and various types of alkylating chemotherapies that broadly destroy the bone marrow and, uh, and the bone marrow microenvironment, um, uh, leaving it completely empty, what if we instead developed safer approaches that are really targeted at just the host hematopoietic stem cells, sparing all of the progenitors, sparing the mature cells, sparing the bone marrow microenvironment, and most importantly, sparing other uh, tissues um, so that they don't have the same collateral damage as currently occurs um, uh, with uh, irradiation or chemotherapy-based conditioning protocols. So we set off to do this initially using antibodies, and now antibodies can be used in various different ways to target and deplete cells. And over the last decade, we've really used these types of antibodies in each of these ways um, uh, to deplete the host hematopoietic stem cells. Initially, our work started around using blocking antibodies um, uh, that were antagonistic to important signaling pathways that HSCs needed to survive. Colleagues then added to this um, uh, and have used um, immune system to actually kill um, hematopoietic stem cells uh, through other means. Um, uh, and then our work as a postdoc out in Boston um, uh, showed that you could actually use antibody drug conjugates uh, as another approach um, to deplete host hematopoietic stem cells. Importantly, when one uses antibody-based conditioning, one needs to go after a target, and the majority of our efforts to date have focused around this target known as CD117 or CKIT. And this is really the first target um, uh, that we had decided to go after um, uh, because it was an obvious one and seemed like a very good fit. Um, uh, CD117 is a very important cell surface um, uh, protein that is known to be primarily expressed on hematopoietic stem cells and progenitors. It's also the receptor ligand for stem cell factor, which is a critical growth factor that stem cells need to stay stem cells. And importantly, it has very minimal expression on other cell types. So for these reasons, this was the primary um, uh, antigen uh, that we decided to target with our antibody-based approaches. Uh, although we have shown that these similar concepts work against our antigens, including CD27, 45, 90, 110, and 184. But again, because our work has uh, done so well against CD117, this is what we've tended to focus on and we'll be using in our current clinical study. Um, uh, and so having um, uh, created these um, concepts, um, uh, we really wanted to test them to see if this, could, this approach could work. Initially, we started doing this um, uh, using antagonistic antibodies, as I mentioned, and specifically, we identified this antagonistic antibody known as ACK2, which blocks the binding of mouse stem cell factor. And importantly, when we treated immunodeficient mice with this antibody, with just a one-time treatment, we were able to show a 98% depletion of host stem cells. And now when we transplanted stem cells um, uh, into these antibody-based conditioned hosts, um, uh, we could get much higher levels of graphite and no longer, no longer saw the saturation that we saw in the unconditioned setting. And now we're able to, again, achieve much higher amounts. And when we transplanted more cells, we no longer were limited to the number um, uh, of cells that engrafted and uh, a specific amount of donor chimerism, but instead we could get extremely high levels. Again, in my follow-on postdoc research done in collaboration with Derek uh, Rossi and David Scadden's group, we showed a similar approach could be used um, uh, using non-antagonistic antibodies um, uh, linked to saporin, um, uh, which is a specific immunotoxin. 
And here we could give um, uh, an order of magnitude less of this immunotoxin than with an antagonistic antibody, get even more profound depletion, now greater than 99% depletion, and see even higher amounts of, uh, of donor engraftment using fewer cells. So again, showing that multiple approaches targeting um, the same antigen could be used to achieve pretty impressive results um, uh, as single non-genotoxic HSC-targeted agents with profound HSC depletion and really high amounts of donor chimers and post-transplant. Very importantly, um, uh, not only were these approaches effective, but they were also extremely safe and well tolerated. And when we've done histology um, uh, of the different uh, tissues of these treated animals, we've really seen no concerns. And here's just a photo of a treated animal versus an irradiated animal, and you can just see the mice look clearly happier and healthier. Uh, and importantly, we haven't seen any of the classic um, uh, issues that are seen with traditional conditioning, such as irradiation and chemotherapy. So no fertility issues, no bleeding issues, no profound cytopenias, um, uh, no uh, organ dysfunction. Um, uh, the only thing that we have seen is that with the naked antagonistic antibody at extremely high doses, we have seen some mild transient graying of the fur as CKIT is involved in melanocytes. And then with the antibody drug conjugate, we have seen a transient um, uh, elevation in the liver transaminases but again, very small and very transient. So much safer um, uh, than uh, traditional approaches. And so given this exciting preclinical data, um, we've been very um, uh, motivated to try to move um, these approaches to patients. Initially with the uh, first version of the antagonistic antibody-based conditioning approach, um, uh, we developed our own in-house anti-CD117 antibodies and then ultimately identified another antibody that was similar to ACK2 known as SR1, um, uh, which was also an antagonistic antibody and showed that that worked very similarly against uh, anti-human um, uh, CD117 and human stem cells and then had identified that Amgen had a very similar antibody that they had developed for a completely different indication. And so we started to use that antibody, which has now been licensed into uh, Jasper. Um, uh, and that antibody is now in clinical trials, and I'll show you some of that data. And that's the antibody that we'll be using in our FA program. Uh, but there are also several other approaches um, uh, as well um, uh, that have been uh, developed uh, and are on their way um, uh, to clinic, uh, including an approach um, uh, combining um, uh, anti-CD117 antibodies with CD47 antibodies that was initially led by 47 and acquired by Gilead, and then an antibody drug conjugate approach um, developed by Magenta Therapeutics, um, uh, which recently um, obtained FDA approval and should hopefully be in patients in the near term as well. Um, uh, and so with each of these approaches moving forward, we're quite excited, um, uh, but the first generation approach, the antagonistic antibody is one that we currently have available today. Um, uh, and very excitingly in the study that was recently conducted um, uh, by uh, Dr. Rajni Agarwal and our CDCM team, um, uh, together with Dr. Judy Shizuru, um, uh, a sponsor, we've seen some really exciting results. In particular, this antibody has been used in the SCID setting. So in patients with severe combined immune deficiency, very similar to our initial mouse studies in um, uh, immunocompromised mice. And 13 uh, SCID patients have been treated to date uh, and they have been uh, extremely well tolerated with this regimen. This was used as a single conditioning regimen with no other um, uh, agents uh, and no treatment related serious adverse events have been noted, no significant infusion related toxicities. And excitingly, um, uh, the antagonistic CD117 antibody, this JSP191, appeared to be biologically active um, uh, with newly noted donor chimers and post stem cell transplant. Uh, and on the right bottom here uh, is just some of the engraftment data um, uh, showing um, uh, the donor engraftment um, uh, in these patients. And we're now seeing um, a new native um, uh, immunoconstitution um, uh, in these patients. Um, not only uh, has this approach um, uh, been effective, but as I mentioned, it has been safe uh, and not just um, uh, safe with no significant adverse events, um, but patients have tolerated this so well that now this is being done in an outpatient setting um, uh, as patients have really had no significant cytopenias, no mucositis and no concerns, um, uh, really questioning why we needed to do um, uh, these initial studies in an inpatient basis. And so again, we are quite excited um, uh, about um, uh, the results of this SCID study and the ability to use this agent uh, and these concepts moving forward. So in our uh, study now, um, we are hoping to combine this exact antibody, this JSP191 antibody, uh, together with optimized um, uh, hematopoietic grafts, uh, and specifically TCR alpha beta T cell CD19 B cell depleted grafts that can be used to decrease infections, uh, decrease graft versus host disease, uh, and increase our ability to use uh, other donors. Uh, and through um, these com combination approaches, our goal is to treat and prevent hematolymphoid failure in patients um, uh, safely and easily with a much more improved innovative tr treatment regimen that again, we hope to ex um, expand to many indications to come.
But we're first starting with Fanconi anemia. And Fanconi anemia is a very important um, uh, disease that affects many patients throughout the world. It's a genetic disease that's caused by abnormal and deficient proteins in the FA pathway. And specifically, there are 23 different genes that are involved in Fanconi anemia, making it very difficult to develop gene therapy for each of them. This is also a, a disease that is uh, caused um, uh, by genetic mutations that then cause the cells to have an inability to repair DNA defects um, uh, and leads to interstrand crosslinks. This causes patients to, um, uh, to develop uh, all sorts of issues, some congenital issues as noted on the left, but these tend to be fairly mild. The most important um, uh, defect that patients unfortunately develop tends to be bone marrow failure, with 80% of patients developing bone marrow failure by the age of 12 and really requiring hematopoietic transplants in order to sustain their hematopoietic system, um, given the severe uh, cytopenias that these patients develop. But unfortunately, these patients also develop very high rates of malignancies, both in their um, hematolymphoid system um, uh, with the development of leukemias, but also solid tissues and squamous cell carcinomas, uh, amongst others. And it's predicted that these patients have over, over 1,000 fold increased risk of malignancies compared to other patients. So our standard of care for these patients is monitoring and, and surveilling them um, uh, and then proceeding um, uh, to hematopoietic stem cell based um, uh, transplants uh, when they develop uh, either severe cytopenias um, uh, or early signs of dysplasia. Um, uh, although we could use these types of treatments uh, up front um, uh, if they were safer um, uh, and uh, equally effective. Um, but because the risks uh, today of these procedures, we really do a lot of surveillance, um, uh, which causes a lot of anxiety for these patients prior to moving to treatment. Uh, while our outcomes as a field have really dramatically improved over the last many decades through the adjustment of various different conditioning regimens, um, uh, patients still experience uh, high rates of infections, leukocytes, organ damage, uh, acute and chronic graft versus host disease, and infertility, not to mention the fact that they need to stay in the hospital for several months during these procedures. But also, unfortunately, patients uh, develop very high rates of secondary malignancies due to defects in the DNA damage repair pathways. As you can um, uh, expect, um, uh, patients that don't have a great ability to repair DNA damage after you've given them uh, total body radiation or alkylating chemotherapy have a hard time reacting to that. Uh, and patients tend to develop um, uh, malignancies at much faster rates um, uh, if they've received um, hematopoietic cell, cell therapies um, uh, rather than the few patients who um, uh, have not needed them as seen uh, on the right um, uh, in this uh, study uh, done by Branch Alters um, uh, Group uh, at the NIH. And so our goal is to really um, uh, prevent all short-term and long-term complications and to ease this treatment for FA patients, potentially even uh, enabling this to be done in a preventative setting rather than waiting for patients to develop bone marrow failure um, uh, or signs of dysplasia. Uh, and so as you've learned um, through the symposium today, our program here at Stanford um, uh, has been pioneering uh, the use of TCR alpha beta T cell CD19 um, B cell depleted grafts, uh, most um, uh, commonly um, uh, with traditional uh, conditioning, including chemotherapy and radiation. And we have this protocol available um, uh, to our Fanconi um, uh, anemia patients, but we're also in the process of opening up this clinical trial, as I mentioned, um, uh, using these grafts in combination um, uh, with this antibody-based conditioning, which we hope will be even safer uh, and equally effective for patients. So what is this trial? Um, uh, I'll tell you in a little bit more detail, um, uh, but if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out and ask. Um, uh, but the main um, uh, difference in this trial is really the preparation of the patient. Um, uh, so this conditioning regimen, again, consists of the use of this JSP191 uh, anti-CD117 monoclonal antibody that is being infused uh, IV as a single um, uh, fixed dose of 0.6 mg per kg. This dose was identified from a dose escalation study um, uh, in the SCID patients, um, where this was the optimal dose that was identified. And this um, dose will be administered to patients, and then pharmacokinetics um, will be carefully um, monitored. And then this will be the first time that this antibody um, uh, is used in immunocompetent setting um, uh, and will therefore be combined um, uh, with immune suppression. Uh, and specifically, um, uh, we'll be using standard uh, immune suppression that has been done in other Fanconi anemia patients uh, using ATG, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, uh, and rituximab. Uh, so really combining um, uh, the standard immunosuppression backbone together with this novel antibody. Uh, and then we'll also be testing um, uh, the pharmacodynamics of this antibody by doing a bone marrow biopsy six days post-treatment to look at additional HSC depletion. And then, as I mentioned, we'll be combining um, uh, this uh, novel conditioning regimen um, uh, together with our TCR alpha beta T cell CD19 B cell depleted hematopoietic grafts um, uh, using our standard um, uh, protocols um, uh, that we use uh, in other clinical settings uh, here at Stanford Children's.
And in combination, um, uh, we believe that these two pieces um, uh, should work um, uh, uh, very well, hopefully, um, uh, for our patients, um, uh, really leading to improved um, uh, outcomes and safer procedures. Our Fanconi Anemia Clinical Trial Patient Eligibility um, is listed here. This is available for all um, forms of Fanconi Anemia uh, and patients in or nearing bone marrow failure without available matched sibling donors. Uh, patients just need to be greater than two years of age and have Fanconi Anemia and have some signs of bone marrow failure, as well as have a consenting um, uh, haploidentical or greater um, uh, donor available for apheresis. And we are not yet treating patients um, uh, with MDS or malignancies, although it is possible that this uh, regimen may be applicable to those settings uh, as well, um, uh, as um, CD117 has also been shown to be expressed uh, on leukemic uh, stem and progenitor cells, um, uh, and so it's possible that this may lead to decreased relapse rates in those settings as well, but our initial trial is um, focused on the bone marrow failure um, uh, setting. And so this uh, trial, as I mentioned, is now um, uh, open, um, uh, and we're starting to screen patients, um, uh, and we expect to have excellent outcomes with decreased toxicity. So if anyone is interested in learning more or has any uh, patients that might be eligible, please reach out to Dr. Agarwal um, uh, or myself. And so with that, I would just like to stop and acknowledge the many, 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 many people um, uh, have been involved in for so now uh, over a decade um, uh, of work, um, uh, including um, uh, my research lab, Ken Weinberg's research lab, uh, the many different facilities here at Stanford that have been helpful, uh, and very importantly, um, uh, our division and the Center for Definitive uh, and Curative Medicine, including Dr. Rajni Agarwal, Dr. Alicia Bertina, and Dr. Maria Grazia Ron Carlo, amongst many others, as well as our clinical trials program that has really helped us put together um, uh, this study. And then, of course, um, my lab and the, the many senior mentors that have helped develop antibody conditioning um, uh, over the years, including Professor Irv Weissman, Dr. Judy Shizuru, uh, and my Boston mentors. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnieszka, for the wonderful talk. The next speaker is Joseph Ovid. I hope that I spell your last name correctly, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And Joseph will give it talk on the alpha-beta T-cell CD19 B-cell depleting mismatch HACT for severe aplastic anemia. You say thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you to everyone for um, inviting me to this fascinating symposium. Um, and today I'll be presenting our data on alpha-beta T-cell CD19 B-cell depleted unrelated donor hematopoietic stem cell transplant for severe um, acquired aplastic anemia. And suggest a primer on bone marrow failure syndromes. Um, bone marrow failure syndromes result in disrupted hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell homeostasis and function, um, which then results in inadequate production of the three cell lineages, your white uh, cells, red cells, and or platelets. And there are two major flavors of the bone marrow failure syndromes. The first is the immune dysregulation or autoimmune, um, the mediated destruction of your bone marrow um, stem cells. Um, and the second is your genetic predispositions, the more classic genetic inherited predisposition um, syndrome, such as Fanconi. Both of these um, two disease types will cause bone marrow failure syndromes, and both can predispose to the development of a variety of malignancies. And for this reason, it is important for um, there to be a multidisciplinary team of hematologists, oncologists, geneticists, transplanters, um, as well as cancer predisposition docs to um, take care of the patient. And so when we think of a patient with persistent low blood counts with or without marrow aplasia in childhood, um, it's really critical to define whether these patients are acquired or inherited. And as you can see here, a vast majority of our pediatric patients will come to us with an acquired bone marrow failure, the lion's share of which is acquired aplastic anemia with or without uh, PNH. However, there are also cases of de novo PNH, hypocellular MDS, and other transient reasons for marrow suppression that must be excluded. On the inherited side, we have the classic syndromes like Fanconi anemia and Schwachmann diamond, but also some of the newer syndromes that have recently been described like GATA2 haploid insufficiency and Mirage syndrome due to SAMD9, SAMD9 L variants. And so why is it of utmost importance to determine whether the aplasia is inherited or acquired? Um, while the treatment approaches are different, um, acquired aplastic anemia can be treated with either immune suppression therapy or with stem cell transplant. While the inherited causes require a stem cell transplant as the only cure. 
Um, there are a variety of other organ systems that can be affected and inherited causes. And there are implications um, for family members, including genetic counseling, um, incomplete penetrance of other family members, as well as screening potential family donors in the inherited section. But in thinking about acquired aplastic anemia, which again is the lion's share of what we see, um, you know, despite decades of research and trying to understand why aplastic anemia happens, there's no clear molecular pathogenesis in, uh, that's been described in the field. However, uh, the prevalent theory is that there's a viral or environmental trigger that causes uh, an immune recognition of an antigen similar to a protein or antigen expressed on your hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. This antigen causes expansion and activation of uh, effector T cells, which continue to divide and migrate to the bone marrow. And there's bone marrow suppression um, for a number of reasons, both direct T cell um, destruction of the uh, progenitor and hematopoietic stem cells, but also the inflammatory milieu that inhibits blood production. And again, it's important to remember that nearly all bone marrow failure syndromes predispose to cancer. Um, again, your inherited uh, causes are up here and have a variety of malignancies for which they are um, associated with, but in acquired aplastic anemia, specifically aplastic anemia treated with immune suppression therapy, um, there is uh, the development or the chance of the development of myelodysplastic syndrome and or AML. Thankfully, in pediatric patients, the lifetime risk is still low, about 5 to 10 percent, whereas in adult patients, that can be as high as 20 to 30 percent. The genetics of this development of MDS-AML are usually age-associated clonal hematopoietic mutations with or without monosomy 7. And for this reason, um, and um, several other reasons, matched sibling donor bone marrow transplant has been the standard of care um, for most pediatric PMS syndromes. And over here, you can see several studies that describe the excellent survival rate um, in patients with aplastic anemia that have been treated with matched sibling donor transplant. It's the treatment of choice for severe acquired aplastic anemia um, and has several indications in inherited bone marrow failure syndromes that you can see here. However, the main problem is that only 15 to 30% of patients have a matched sibling donor. And so our big problem was how to increase event-free and overall survival of alternative donor hematopoietic stem cell transplant to equal that of matched sibling bone marrow transplant. And so we chose to use the unrelated donor stem cell transplant um, platform um, because while haploidentical and cord blood approaches are efficacious in transplants for malignancies and metabolic disorders, they have a high rate of graft failure in pediatric patients with non-malignant diseases and in particular immune-mediated uh, non-malignant diseases like aplastic anemia. And so when one considers what a tier of pleat unrelated donor transplant would look like, survival is much improved, but there again remains problems. And that is finding a fully matched donor. You can see over here that while European um, descendants may have a 70% chance of finding an HLA match, several ethnicities have, have abysmal chances of finding an, HLH ma an HLA match, including less than 20% for some African-American populations. However, allowing a one antigen mismatch will ameliorate this problem significantly for um, almost all um, ethnic patient populations. That said, one, and one antigen mismatch comes with the cost of increased GVHD, which is uh, you know, significantly worse in the mismatch setting than in a fully matched unrelated donor. And so therein lies um, the reason that we chose to go with a partial T cell depletion of unrelated donor peripheral um, stem cell grafts. And the partial T cell depletion approach has you know, significant advantages in the non-malignant setting. It allows us to deliver a high stem cell dose, which enables rapid engraftment. We have decreased GVHD compared to the T replete unrelated donor setting, and we have decreased graft rejection and improved immune reconstitution compared to the full T cell depleted, the haplo and the umbilical cord approaches. And so we started um, our investigations with a partial CD3 and CD19 um, cell depletion. This was done as a retrospective analysis of a CHOP expanded access protocol, where we would collect our donor peripheral stem cells. We would use a Clinomax device to deplete the CD3 and CD19 cells, um, and then add back a targeted one times 10 to the fifth CD3 cells per kilo to the graft product prior to infusion. <clears throat> 
The transplant period um, was 2014 to 2017. 12 patients were treated on this expanded access protocol, and it included all non-malignant hematologic diseases. Seven of the 12 patients had severe acquired aplastic anemia with or without PNH. All received unrelated donor transplants. Um, and the GVHD rejection prophylaxis was calcineurin inhibitors um, and mycophenolate. Interestingly, the time to transplant from diagnosis in this, in this cohort was 4.1 years. And here are the characteristics of this cohort. Um, you can see that the seven patients with severe acquired aplastic anemia and or PNH are listed at the top. Um, they had HLA matches of either eight out of 10, nine out of 10, or 10 out of 10. Conditioning was with thymoglobulin, fludarabine, uh, 100 per kilo of cytoxan, and 200 centigrade of TBI. We increased the TBI to 300 centigrade for those with significant PNH clones defined as a clone of 30% or more. Median CD34 dose that we were able to deliver was 12 times 10 to the sixth per kilo. Neutrophil and platelet engraftment were on, 13, on days 13.5 and 15 post-transplant per the CIVMTR criteria. And so we've had excellent outcomes in this platform. GDHD and disease-free survival at our last follow-up continues to be 100%. Median follow-up time is 740 days with all patients having transfusion independence and normal ANC, none having a head graft failure and none requiring systemic immune suppression for GDHD. And looking at our GVHD data in a little bit more granularity, one patient developed a grade two stage three skin GVHD that responded to a short prednisone course. No patients had grade three to four acute GVHD. Two patients had eczema as the only manifestation of chronic limited GVHD and was treated with topical steroids and none had chronic extensive GVHD. And I will point out that all the GVHD occurred in patients with nine out of 10 HLA matches. And so we wanted to um, try and improve on this platform and that bore out the TCR alpha beta T cell with CD19 uh, depletion. This was a prospective trial that we opened at CHOP um, for unrelated and partially matched related donors um, with alpha beta depletion in patients with bone marrow failure syndromes. And so again, we collected our peripheral stem cells from donors. And in this case, we just did a, an alpha beta and CD19 depletion using the Clinimax device. And, um, infuse the product retaining the MK cells and gamma delta cells um, directly into the patient. This trial opened in 2017 and is still open in recruiting patients. Um, all bone marrow failure uh, patients were eligible for treatment on this trial at the exclusion of MDS. And importantly, an amendment was passed about a year after the trial opened um, that abrogated the need for prior IST failure. Um, to qualify for uh, treatment on this protocol. All donors were unrelated. Rejection prophylaxis was with a calcineurin inhibitor alone. And EBV prophylaxis was with rituximab on day plus one if the recipient was EBV positive. The primary hypothesis of our study was that unrelated hematopoietic stem cell transplant for bone marrow failure using the alpha beta T cell depletion and CD19 depletion um, would result in efficient, durable donor engraftment with low rates of GVHD. We had four objectives to the study to evaluate the efficiency and durability of engraftment, to determine the incidence and extent of acute and chronic GVHD, assess incidence of viral reactivation, and assess mortality and survival outcomes. 23 patients enrolled on the trial, 21 of which were treated. One had the donor decline study, and one had a revised diagnosis that precluded them from the study. An additional five patients were treated like the study, three of which were aplastic anemia patients that were seeking upfront stem cell transplant uh, prior to the amendment and eligibility criteria having been approved. Over here are our conditioning regimens. Again, they were the same as what was given in the partial CD3 um, cohort. And so for aplastic anemia, thymoglobulin, low dose TBI, depending on your PNH clone, fludarabine, and cytoxan, and then for your single lineage disorders, um, of course, they got lineage specific um, or syndrome specific conditioning as listed here. The demographics of our cohorts are listed here. The median age of transplant in both our alpha beta and our partial CD3 depletion cohort was 11 years of age. Um, there was an equal mix of females and males in both cohorts, and there was a, a wide distribution of ethnicities across the cohorts. 
And looking at the diseases that were treated, the lion's share, not surprisingly, um, for both trials was uh, aplastic anemia with or without PNH, which made up a full 84% of our alpha beta cohort. Um, but most interesting was that the time from diagnosis to transplant um, in our alpha beta cohort was only 0.4 years, so less than half a year, where as in our partial CD3 cohort, it was 4.1 years. And this had a lot to do with most of the aplastic anemia patients now either requesting upfront therapy or um, moving to upfront therapy. This also resulted in a significant decline in the number of patients that had um, uh, 10 or more lifetime PRBC transfusions, 53% versus 91.7% previously, as well as a significant number of patients that had seen no prior therapy before coming to transplant and were thus in a much uh, better fitness for transplant. Here are the HLA matches for our unrelated donors um, in our two trials in the alpha-beta cohort. We had 15 10 out of 10s and 11 9 out of 10s, and in the CD3 cohort, 4 10 out of 10s, 7 10, uh, 9 out of 10s, and 1 8 out of 10. In looking at our uh, stem cell doses and engraftment times, our alpha-beta cohort was able to deliver a 12 times 10 to the 6 median uh, CD34 cells per kilo, which was similar to our partial CD3 cohort. And time to engraftment was 15 days for both neutrophils and platelets per CIBMTR criteria. Comparing our engraftment to our matched sibling donor cohort in bone marrow failure, you can see in blue, the alpha beta cohort has a much more robust engraftment, which is even more striking considering that our matched sibs traditionally received GCSF to promote more rapid engraftment and the alpha beta cohort did not receive any growth factors. This allowed us to discharge most of our patients by days 20 to 21 post-transplant, which is about a full week earlier than most of our matched SIBs and allowed us to deliver an alpha-beta depleted transplant in a cost-effective manner. When looking at our overall outcomes, um, our alpha-beta um, approach has a median follow-up time of 727 days. Disease-free and overall survival are 96.2%. Unfortunately, we had one death due to a toxoplasmosis-induced HLH that led to multi-organ system failure on day plus 95 post-transplant. Other toxicities that we saw were two mild VODs and one late TATMA, all of which resolved with appropriate treatment. We did have one patient develop an EBV-driven PTLD that required chemotherapy and EBV-specific um, cytolytic lymphocytes. However, um, deep molecular analysis and sequencing suggests that this actually was present prior to transplant. Um, and there's more data forthcoming on this. Um, in looking at our GVHD um, data in a little bit more granularity again, one patient developed stage two skin GVHD that resolved with a five-day prednisolone course, and one patient had dry scalp and eczema, again, requiring topical steroids and now resolved. We saw no other GVHD mild or severe. Our chimerism um, total and myeloid were excellent across both cohorts. Um, and our T-cell chimerism was also excellent. However, you will notice that there was some delayed T-cell um, chimerism in a few patients. And so it took about a year for some of the patients to achieve um, you know, regular or maximal T-cell chimerism. We had robust immune reconstitution across all of our cell compartments. This allowed all patients to start a revaccination protocol um, by at least one year post-transplant, most started by six to eight months post-transplant. And then in looking at our viral reactivation, um, and viral reactivation was defined as patients that required antiviral therapy, we did notice that there was a common uh, CMV reactivation, but it had a low viral load. No patients had any end organ damage, and it resolved in all cases with traditional anti-CMV agents and um, no patients required CTLs. And looking at the median last positive serum PCR for CMV, our matched sib cohort had a day plus 22 median, our CD3 cohort a day plus 125, and not surprisingly, the alpha beta fell somewhere in between a day plus 76. I mentioned the one patient that had the EBV-driven PTLT, um, and here are the other viral reactivations that we saw. And so to conclude, unrelated donor peripheral stem cell transplant with alpha-beta T-cell depletion and CD19 depletion 
in pediatric patients with non-malignant hematologic diseases, and in particular with um, immune-mediated aplastic anemia, is associated with rapid trilinear engraftment with stable donor chimerism, a very low risk of graft failure, a low risk of grade three to four acute or extensive chronic GVHD, excellent immune reconstitution, and low incidence of viral disease. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who um, has worked with me on this and who has helped with this. In particular, my mentor at CHOP, um, Dr. Timothy Olson, um, and my mentor now at MSK, uh, Dr. Bolens, Dr. Prokop, and Dr. Tansio. The next speaker is Alice Bertaina from Stanford University, the Division of Stem Cell Transplantation and Regenerative Medicine, Hematology Oncology, and the Center of uh, Definitive and Curative Medicine. And Alice is the great organizer, the driver force behind this wonderful symposium. Um, Alicia will give a talk on the alpha beta T cell CD19 B cell depleted aplodentical stem cell transplantation and solid organ transplant to promote functional immunotolerance. Alicia. Thank you so much, Maria Grazia, for the very kind introduction. I'm excited uh, today to share you uh, to share with you some of uh, let's say preliminary data that we have on the application of alpha beta T cell depleted transplant as a platform for a different immunotherapy. Yesterday, I, I presented you what is the vision uh, for treating mostly um, leukemias. Uh, and today I wanna uh, turn around uh, another topic, which I believe uh, it can really become uh, groundbreaking considering the need uh, that is out there of having a, a more solid solution to chronic rejection and lifelong immune suppression. And of course, we are not the first one in thinking that um, it would be great if we can promote immune tolerance after solid organ transplantation so that um, we can abolish the use of lifelong immune suppression and therefore uh, the risk of chronic rejection along with all the complications that come with immune suppression. We all know that patients uh, who remain in treatment uh, for their entire life uh, with calcineurin inhibitor or other immune suppression are exposed to risk of infection, but also um, secondary um, neoplasia uh, as uh, PTLD, for example. And uh, very often uh, these patients really have problem in compliance with this medication and therefore the risk of rejection become even bigger. Many groups really investigate in the role of allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant to uh, address this problem, uh, mostly in adults. And there are two, three groups that specifically worked hard uh, to um, get to this goal. And one of these groups uh, is led by uh, Sam Strober and Robert Lowski here at Stanford. Uh, their goal was to establish a mixed lymphoid chimerism that could allow um, really the establishment of an immune tolerance. However, although uh, the use of a uh, reduced uh, toxicity conditioning regimen with TLI and ATG, along with the CD34 positive selected graft, uh, achieved the goal of the mixed lymphoid chimerism, it was never possible in this group of patients to completely eliminate uh, the need of at least one immunosuppressive drug. Um, other groups like um, uh, the Northwestern University and the group of Megan Sachs uh, try to reach instead a full donor chimerism, so a complete uh, hemopoietic and lymphoid engraftment. But in this experience, some cases in which patients achieved a full donor engraftment resulted in fatal graft versus host disease. So the balance between uh, the, the full donor chimerism, the toxicity, and the graft versus host disease is a very delicate one. And in the pediatric age, uh, there is no study or there is no group that at least programmatically intended to address this issue. So this is where our rationale lies. Um, and, and therefore, our really um, our main, uh, main goals. Uh, the problem of chronic rejection and uh, lifelong immune suppression affect a huge number of patients. Uh, 
and I was really, really surprised <laughs> during my discussion with the, uh, with the solid organ transplant team here at Stanford and specifically uh, the renal transplantation team that the average uh, survival for a graft is uh, about 12 years when this graft uh, comes from a, a cadaver and 19 years when this graft comes from a living donor. What does it mean? It means that the majority of the pediatric patients who are in the need of a solid organ transplant in their pediatric age will require at least a second transplant during their lifespan. So this for me was a, an awareness that was quite shocking. And in US, there are about 1,500 children every year who require a solid organ transplant. So definitely the protocol of supportive therapy and the introduction of living donor, donor transplant improved at least the short-term outcomes. But as I said, the long-term outcomes remain this small, especially for uh, the immune-mediated graft rejection, the viral infection, and the requirement of a repeated transplant. So here comes our hypothesis, right? That if we are able to replace the recipient immune system with donor-derived T cells, then we can make the uh, a, a patient, which is basically unable to reject a, um, a graft, a solid organ graft, because the immune system is going to be the same of the one who is uh, receiving the solid organ from. And our goals while thinking about this project were pretty ambitious. First of all, achieving a full donor chimerism, especially on the T cell lineage, so that we would be really able to achieve the second goal, which is abrogating the need for lifelong immune suppression. And lastly, eliminate the chronic graft rejection and therefore the need of repeated solid organ transplantation. And I can tell you that uh, today we have the proof of concept that this approach is doable and can now broaden uh, to other indication. The proof of concept come from the, um, if you wanna say, you know, fortunate opportunity of transplanting three children affected by a very rare disorder, Schimke immunoosseodysplasia. dysplasia. This is an incredibly rare disorder, which includes T cell immunodeficiency, a progressive evolution to bone marrow failure syndrome, amongst other uh, organ involvement, but also a, an involvement of kidney disease with the focal um, sclerosis, glomerular sclerosis, which inevitably ends in end organ stage disease. So these patients, when they are affected by a severe phenotype of the disease, usually die by the age of nine years. Uh, mostly because of infection related to the T cell immunodeficiency and the bone marrow failure syndrome, but they are dependent from dialysis by the age of three or four because of the rapid uh, development of this chronic insufficiency. The uh, underlying disorder is a biallelic mutation of the SMARCAL1 protein, and so these patients are also affected by um, strokes, um, infarct, and uh, atherosclerosis, which complicates their life. So far, the outcome of allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in this specific condition was incredibly small. In the literature, there are reported five cases, and four of them died, mostly because of transplant-related complication. And this is also because if all this list of problems I mentioned you was not enough, these patients also have a, a DNA breakage, and therefore, myeloblative condition arrangement are not really recommended because of the risk of high toxicity and high mortality. So what we did uh, in our center was designing an ad hoc uh, protocol, which could have combined on one side a preparative regimen, which was myeloblative, but of reduced intensity, uh, a transplant which was um, alpha beta T cell depleted from one of the two parents, and then the kidney transplant from the same parent who served as a stem cell donor, uh, who would have allowed, in our hypothesis, a, a withdrawal of the immune suppression early after the solid organ transplant. 
So as you can see here, we use a, a conditioning regimen, which I called Fanconi-like, because we translated that from our experience with patients with Fanconi and with this keratosis congenita. We use a, a total dose of 7.5 milligram per kg of ATG. Since these patients were uh, in chronic kidney disease, two of them were in dialysis at the time of transplant, and one was on uh, stage four of CKD, we uh, evaluated uh, prospectically fludarabine PK that uh, made it possible to modulate the dose of the fludarabine to achieve an ideal AUC of 20 milligram per hour liter, and then a total dose of 1200 milligram per square meter of cyclophosphamide. To ensure immune suppression and engraftment, we also add to the preparative regimen TBI 200 centigrade. And in line with our platform, we use a dose of rituximab on day minus one before the transplant as prevention of EBV related PTLD. Uh, no patient received pharmacological immune suppression after the transplant. The graft composition was really good with very low dose of alpha beta T cells. Five, uh, 5.5 and 10 months after the stem cell transplant, all these patients receive a living donor kidney transplant from the same stem cell donor. And for all of them, it was possible to uh, withdraw completely the immune suppression, which consisted of low dose of steroids and tacrolimus by day 30 after transplant. Actually, for patient number three, since she developed hyperglycemia on day plus five after the kidney transplant, we had to stop first the steroids and then the tacrolimus. And so this period of immune suppression was even more limited for this specific uh, patient. And I'm excited to share with you that now these patients are 26, 15, and 14 months after the kidney transplant. They are completely free from any pharmacological immune suppression. They have a normal uh, creatinine and no sign, no clinical sign of rejection. Uh, this was possible because really we were able to achieve a full donor chimerism on all lineages. Uh, for patients number one and number three, this full donor chimerism was achieved at the time of engraftment. While for patients number two, uh, it was a mixed chimerism, about 85% donor in the first two months, and then it got to 100% by day 150. But the other important thing is that those patients had a rapid and robust immune reconstitution, as you can see here, and they had a, a normal response to the PHA at the time of receiving the kidney transplant, really allowing for an excellent uh, prevention of any potential viral reactivation who could have complicated the kidney transplantation, such as often happen with BK or adenoviruses. But to really demonstrate that we were able to promote functional tolerance after solid organ transplantation with this strategy, uh, Giulia Barbarito, along with uh, the collaboration of David Lewis, Robbie Parkman, and Ken Weinberg, perform a one-year post-kidney transplant for all these three patients and mix lymphocyte culture. So what she did was really uh, evaluate the uh, response of T cells isolated from the patients against um, EBV, LCL, um, that were manufactured from uh, each donor and a third party control. And here you can see that the presentation. Uh, what is really impressive is that if, for example, you look at the patient one, in this case, donor one was the stem cell donor. And you can see that uh, with this evaluation, which was the cell trace violet evaluation, there is no response towards donor one, while the T cells of the patient maintain a response against the, the other parent and against the, a third party control. For patient number two, who is the sibling, youngest sibling of patient number one, the donor was the father, in this case, the donor number two. So again, we don't have response against the donor two because we have tolerance, but we have a normal response against the mother and against the third party control. So in this way, we were able to show that not only clinically, we didn't have a sign of rejection, but from an immunological perspective, we were able to uh, promote what we call functional tolerance.
This is a slide just to show you uh, what was, uh, give you a sense of what was the immune reconstitution in these three patients. I didn't mention that uh, two of these three patients received a uh, infusion of uh, T cells of the donor genetically modified with the uh, inducible caspase 9 suicide gene, because at the time we still had the um, Bellicum trial open, and so they were um, eligible for a compassionate use. So patient number one and patient number two received uh, one million per keg of T cells genetically modified as they described uh, on day plus 21 after the transplant. Um, however, what is more interesting of this data that, again, Julia produced in the lab is that these patients, these SIOD patients are able to um, mature, promote to have a, mat a mature naivety cell immune reconstitution that you can see really being consistent starting six months uh, post transplant for both CD4 and CD8 positive cells. And this is a very important information because it really demonstrates that the immunodeficiency, the T cell immune deficiency, which is mostly on the uh, naive compartment in SIOD patients, is stem cell uh, autonomous and is curable by the transplant. Somehow, um, you know, um, not confirming some theories that in SIOD patients, the problem is mostly related to the stroma of the thymus than the stem cell themselves. In figure C, you can see uh, the example of patient number one who received the derivo cell. And so in blue, you have the contribution of these cells. You can see that the majority of these cells in these patients are central memory and effector memory. So this is where their expansion in the infusion into the patients was responsible of. However, we heard from Franco that analysis on track and crack showed a, an impact on the infusion of the rival cells. So we cannot exclude that in these patients, a better naive immune reconstitution could also have favored by uh, the infusion of the rival cells themselves. And this is just to tell you that all these three patients are home. Uh, living a normal life without uh, really uh, needing uh, dialysis, which was uh, compromising the quality of life. And we are incredibly uh, privileged uh, that we were able to, uh, to treat them and to give them another chance. So if I need to uh, summarize what is the lesson that we learned so far with this experience, I would say that using this approach, we achieved the two main goals. In this case, we had patients with a T-cell immune deficiency and with a genetic disease. So we needed to have an immune ablation able to really uh, establish a, a new donor-derived system, uh, eliminating the uh, underlying disease. But second, because we used the same stem cell and kidney donor, we were able to enable a functional tolerance so that now the immune system of this patient is completely unable to reject uh, the graft that has been transplanted. And in fact, all these patients, as I said, have a completely normal function and they continue to have a full lymphoid and myeloid donor chimerism. So what's next? Well, two couple of things that I wanted to share with you. One is of course the uh, evaluation of a better understanding of what is really happening for promoting tolerance. Uh, in those patients. And uh, with this, I mean in the SIOD patients, but also in other patients who are receiving solid organ transplant. And we all know about the important and fundamental role of regulatory T cells on that. But Priscilla Slepicka in the lab is asking if the innate uh, immune compartment, which is so crucial in this specific platform, has a regulatory role that can uh, help in this case to promote a more effective and expedite um, uh, tolerance. And specifically, she is looking into the role of regulatory gamma delta T and regulatory NK cells. But the first question is, do gamma delta regulatory cells really exist? And the answer at this moment is, I don't know. There are some reports that are showing that gamma delta T cells induced in different way can actually uh, suppress. 
And some of these papers are reporting the expression of FASP3, although the majority of them do not report it. And in this figure, it shows how it is supposed to work gamma delta T cells in, uh, in, in, her, in her regulatory properties, either uh, recruiting suppressor T cells through the production of cytokines or suppressing itself um, the um, the alpha beta T cells or inducing apoptosis. But one of the main limitations of the study published so far on this topic is that they, there is no evaluation of really the, the function of the immune suppression and how much these gamma delta T cells, once induced in different uh, cultures, can suppress. And so this is a, a preliminary experiment that Priscilla did using, in this case, um, uh, three healthy donor control. Uh, Priscilla really took a PBMC from these three healthy donors and they incubated them with uh, the uh, condition that you can see here that are coming from the majority of the data present in the literature combining IL-2, IL-15, TGF beta. And uh, this condition have been uh, maintained for six days. Then she sorted the gamma delta T cells and they were co-cultured for four days with the purified autologous T effector cells stained with cell trace violet. So in this case, once incubated, no other cytokines were added. And so she evaluated the level of suppression. And you can see that the highest level of suppression, which was about 50%, was in the condition which uh, used the IL-2, IL-15, and TGF-beta. However, uh, these cells, I can tell you, did not express uh, FOXP3. And, and in fact, our hypothesis is really that if uh, present, the potential markers of gamma delta T cells, regulatory T cells, are very different from those evaluated in the conventional T cells. And so uh, Priscilla is doing further studies uh, of single cell analysis where RNA seek to uh, identify them. Uh, the story about the NK regulatory cells uh, is uh, very intriguing as well. This is a paper published uh, by the group of Kirk Schultz, uh, which really identified this population of um, CD65, CD56, uh, sorry, bright uh, NK cells, which have regulatory properties, and they, they have been found at much higher level in transplanted patients uh, who did not develop graft resource disease. So uh, Priscilla is looking at the new constitution of this specific NK subset to evaluate if there is a role uh, of that as well. But to conclude our experience in this uh, preliminary um, uh, data on solid organ transplant, I would say that today in 2021, we have this platform uh, that is a safe and effective platform for immunotherapy. And in my eyes, immunotherapy is not just adding some cell therapy. Uh, because of this uh, proof of concept data with the SIOD, which have been so exciting, Paul Grimm convinced me that we need to open a protocol for patients with FSGS and cystinosis. And again, how did he convince me? He told me that for a patient with FSGS who rejected a first kidney graft, the chance that he reject a second cadaveric graft is over 95%. So why don't try really to give a chance to these patients who do not have a chance? And I also believe that uh, the data, uh, the body of data that we are establishing are going to allow us to potentially expand this approach safely to a number of other indications and specifically to living donor liver and why not small intestine transplant where the rate of rejection are even higher than in the kidney transplant. So uh, the reason why I believe that this approach uh, can work and is different from the one so far published and employed, especially in adult group, is because, first of all, uh, the reasons why pediatric patients need a solid organ transplant are very different are not hypertension and diabetes, like it happens mostly in adults, but autoimmune or metabolic disorder. And therefore, um, we need um, living, donor, uh, living donors of solid organ transplant that can guarantee a better outcome. And for uh, while we have a more sibling donor available for adults, 
we are not ethically allowed to use minors, sibling, donors for uh, pediatric patients. The use of immunoblation for before the stem cell transplant is going to allow to cure the underlying autoimmune or metabolic disorder, which is the reason why the patient has the kidney disease, and therefore will also um, abrogate the risk that the disease can come back again because the immune system will have a totally different TCR repertoire and therefore uh, abrogate the possibility that there is a relapse on, uh, on that kidney. Uh, and ultimately, with the establishing of a full donor lymphoid chimerism, will really render this patient unable to reject. And in this way, we hope that we can reduce and uh, ideally eliminate the need for these pediatric patients of a second transplant in their lifespan. And I wanna conclude just with the slide for thanking everybody who contributed uh, and is contributing to this study. Uh, yesterday, I uh, thanked especially the stem cell transplant clinical team and the clinical trial program who remain really integral parts of whatever I presented today. Uh, I need to give a spe special shout out to Priscilla Slepicka, who is uh, leading the effort uh, on SIOD and evaluation on immune tolerance in the lab. The fantastic collaboration with Paul Grimm and his team, as well as with David Lewis and all his laboratory. Nothing uh, would be possible without the dedicated, motivated and compassionate stem cell hospitalist and nurse practitioner team. And I wanna give just one name, Karen Kristovich, who followed with me really incredibly these uh, three uh, patients that I mentioned. And of course, uh, all the um, uh, organization who are supporting us, but especially the Kruzen for a Cure Foundation, which is funded by a family with two SIOD patients. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Alice, uh, for the wonderful talk. The next speaker, uh, Chris Dovorak from UCSF, Benioff Children Hospital, will give a talk on non-TBI based conditioning for ALL and NGS MRD negative. Chris, take it from here. So um, the subtitle to this is, can alpha-beta T-cell depleted haplotransplant eliminate what I consider to be the worst part of transplant for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia? So, there is a long-standing belief uh, in the field that TBI is associated with uh, improved relapse control in patients with ALL due to better uh, direct leukemia cell killing compared to chemotherapy-based regimens. But I think it's also equally clear that TBI is a, if not the major risk factor for late effects following transplant. And while TBI has not significantly changed since 1990 when uh, we introduced fractionation, uh, Chemotherapy-based regimens have significantly improved over the last several decades, um, busulfan-based regimens, obviously, but uh, other agents we're getting much smarter at as well, especially fludarabine and rabbit ATG, which we can now uh, target, and other agents like melphalan and thiotepa we may be able to target in the near future. And so while TBA came first historically, I invite you to, to question um, over the course of the next 20 minutes whether uh, or not, if we were inventing transplant for ALL from scratch in 2021, would we still pick TBI as the standard of care? I think everybody knows uh, that TBI conditioning is uh, really bad in the very young children. This is data on the left-hand side from a US-based group led by Christy Duncan, uh, showing the hazard ratio of various late effects in uh, patients who received uh, TBI under three years of age uh, with uh, significantly increased uh, rates compared to patients undergoing chemotherapy-based regimens. And the Europeans also showed uh, similar uh, problems uh, with a cumulative incidence of uh, late effects of over 90% in uh, patients under three years of age receiving TBI. So if you can receive TBI, uh, if you can't, if you can get rid of TBI in the, in the younger kids, uh, can you do it in the older kids and, and would it be important? So uh, even in the older kids, there's um, downsides to TBI. So many of our papers that we write, of course, end um, our follow-up at five years. We don't really think about what happens to these patients uh, 15, 20, 25 years later. But uh, TBI recipients do have uh, significantly increased excess absolute risk of secondary cancers, 
um, for those patients who survive more than five years post-transplant, and especially less than 10 years of age, uh, the rates are, are really, I think, astronomically um, uh, increased compared to no TBI recipients. So is TBI really required? This is a very recent meta-analysis uh, looking at uh, various publications um, on this. And you can see that there is a, a slight benefit in the risk ratio for uh, the incidence of relapse uh, for uh, TBI-based uh, preparative regimens. There's a couple of problems with this meta-analysis. First is that it's almost exclusively in adults. Uh, it's mainly looking at uh, relatively untargeted busulfan regimens, uh, and it's almost exclusively matched sibling and unrelated donor transplants and did not take into account uh, MRD status, especially NGS MRD. And so I wonder if this would hold true in pediatric alpha beta T cell depleted haplotransplants with targeted BU or other agents, especially if the patient is NGS MRD negative. So the Europeans published this uh, important study last year looking at uh, randomizing patients to receive TBI based conditioning or chemotherapy uh, for ALL with, again, uh, MATSIB and unrelated donor transplants, randomized either 1,200 TBI plus uh, BP16, or BU with, without a, um, an exposure noted in the paper that I could find, or triosulfan-based regimens, and almost half of the patients were uh, MRD positive by either flow or PCR. And what they showed uh, was that the TBI-based regimens in red had significantly lower relapse uh, than uh, patients getting either busulfan or triosulfan. So that's a little concerning. The U.S. Uh, consortium uh, is planning to ask uh, the same question with a, with a little twist, which is that it will be only in patients uh, with next-generation sequencing um, MRD negative status at the time of transplant. And that study is being led by uh, Dr. Abdel Azim and uh, Dr. Quigg and is currently running through the PT. PTCTC. I think everybody on the call probably is relatively familiar with next generation sequencing uh, technology for ALL. So I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but it's basically looking at the unique uh, VDJ recombinations that are uh, found in uh, the leukemic clones. And it gets down to about 10 to the negative six um, in terms of its depth, which is, which is quite great. And they give you these really nice reports uh, with uh, the, the, whether your uh, clone is detected and what it looks like over time. This patient went, you know, at, at uh, diagnosis, had a lot of disease, went down, relapsed back into um, semi-remission, got worse, and then finally transplanted and uh, been doing well since then. So Dr. Pulsifer, of course, originally published this beautiful paper on the left uh, showing that um, patients that were NGS MRD negative had significantly lower relapse rates than those that were NGS MRD positive. And we published a couple of years ago a, a sort of real world um, single center experience uh, showing uh, very, very similar outcomes um, in our MRD. NGS MRD negative patients and positive with a group of patients that couldn't have NGS MRD uh, tested due to various logistical reasons uh, being somewhere in between. The one difference between these two um, studies is that uh, Dr. Pulsifer's paper showed, um, or the patients in this paper were 100% uh, TBI based conditioning and only about half of the patients in our paper uh, received TBI. Uh, and you can see despite that, the, the curves look pretty similar. And I think because that's because GVL in acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a real thing. This is a nice um, analysis showing that uh, low-grade GVHD significantly impacts um, and prevents uh, relapse in patients with uh, pediatric ALL uh, and results in better disease-free survival. Of course, uh, severe graft-versus-host disease uh, worsens survival. So the goal of transplant for ALL is really, I think, to get a graft in get an adequate GVL um, response without serious graft versus host disease. And so it brings me back to my question, is this really required for patients with ALL? Theoretically, the, the super strong GVL effect that we can get with alpha beta T cell depleted haplo should be sufficient to cure patients without the need for TBI. And if so, this would be a real advance because we would have less long-term side effects. And if the um, uh, 
the NRAD study is negative, for example, and we cannot eliminate TBI from matched sibling donor or MUD transplants, this property of alpha beta T cell depleted uh, haplos would uh, potentially make it the preferable treatment option for patients with ALL. So what data is out there? Well, Dr. Locatelli uh, published this several years ago and then gave us an update this morning that uh, looked relatively similar that um, in patients in Italy uh, with acute leukemia, uh, TBI-based re uh, regimens were associated with much better leukemia-free survival than uh, those getting non-TBI-based regimens. Though the non-TBI-based regimens were relatively small in number um, and were a mixture of uh, buflu thiotepa and bucy melphalan. This was also a mixed population of ALL and AML. And I think one very important difference uh, between the Italian paper um, and, and ongoing studies is that they use grafalon. It's not available in the US and they give it much closer to transplant potentially resulting in um, uh, more in vivo T cell depletion with a longer tail of uh, post-transplant uh, residual ATG. The US studies that I'm gonna show in a minute here use thymoglobulin and uh, we give our ATG from days minus 10 to minus 12. Um, so probably much less around on day zero when the cells are going in. So Dr. Uh, Abdelazim and Pulsifer uh, presented this um, data at uh, TCT as a best abstract earlier this year. And they were kind enough to share the underlying data set with me so I could reanalyze this um, looking at just the ALL patients and specifically looking at their MRD status. And just to remind you, uh, this, there were several different arms to this study, but the data I'm gonna show uh, comes from what we call the phase two arm, uh, which were patients less than 22 years of age in CR1 or 2, uh, and for this particular analysis, just ALL, and they had to have an eligible cure-favorable haplodonor, which was um, uh, tested at a single lab uh, at CHOP and uh, required either um, a good B content or an inhibitory ligand mismatch. There were a couple different allowed preparative regimens on this trial. Um, uh, half of the patients got a myeloablative regimen based on uh, primarily TBI. So 16 of the ALL patients got a TBI-based PrEP. And a busulfan-based uh, regimen was um, used in just a, a handful of patients, uh, at least with ALL. A reduced toxicity regimen was with, based on melphalan was used in a, uh, about 22 patients, half of with, uh, them with ALL. Um, and I think a lot of that was uh, done at UCSF. And then a couple of patients got a TLI um, melphalan based regimen. Standard uh, cell processing goals, 34 uh, dose greater than 10, alpha beta dose less than one times 10 to the fifth, uh, no GVHD prophylaxis. And on this regimen, uh, rituximab was given on day plus one only if the B cell count was high. So looking at just the uh, ALL patients, they were pretty evenly mixed. Again, this is not randomized, this is center choice, but the median age was similar, though obviously younger patients uh, incorporated into the non-TBI group. Um, maybe a few more patients with T-cell disease in the TBI group, and perhaps um, a little bit of more patients getting uh, transplant in CR2 in the TBI group. All these patients were flow negative, and of the patients where uh, NGS MRD was available, which is not all the patients, 75% uh, in each group were negative. Donor age, uh, sex, and type were, I think, pretty comparable between the two conditioning regimens. So to remind people uh, what uh, Hisham uh, presented in February, the disease-free and overall survival uh, was excellent for these patients. Uh, over 80% uh, for both with a median follow-up of about a year and a half, uh, at least in the data that he sent me last week. And I think very importantly, there was no difference in uh, transplant layer mortality or relapse uh, between the TBI-based uh, recipients and the non-TBI-based recipients. So um, there was only one uh, toxic death in the non-TBI group, which was in a patient uh, with busulfan. None of the melphalan patients uh, experienced uh, non-relapse mortality. And you can see the, the relapse rates um, are certainly no worse for the non-TBI-based patients. So that, of course, leads to uh, really excellent and, uh, no, and comparable disease-free and overall survival, 
you can see these curves uh, on the left clearly overlap. And in the non-TBI-based patient, one patient uh, was salvaged with a second, uh, also non-TBI-based uh, alpha-beta T-cell depleted haplo, and as a long-term survivor, which is why this curve looks a little better. Very surprisingly, there was no difference in survival by NGS MRD status. So um, 16 patients were NGS MRD negative, and they were completely overlapping in their disease-free survival with the NGS MRD positive patients. Uh, overall survival looked um, a little bit better for the NGS MRD negative uh, begin because we salvaged one patient with a second transplant. The unknowns uh, looked a little bit worse, but that was not due to relapse. Both of these were um, non-relapse mortality deaths. And so I don't, don't know what to make of, of that data, but I think this is a, a really, interesting and important slide that, um, that our disease-free survival in our alpha beta T cell depleted haplos was identical between uh, those with um, positive disease and negative. Again, flow negative, but uh, NGS MRD positive did uh, very, very well. And so, you know, I think this, this somewhat contradicts Mike's original paper where uh, the NGS MRD positive patients did a lot worse and despite the fact that um, only half of these patients got a TBI-based PrEP, and I think this really speaks to the power of haplo-GVL, which um, again, we didn't see in this on the left with um, our matched sibling and unrelated donor transplants. But don't take my word for it. Uh, Dr. Bertina published this paper a couple of years ago where she showed that um, the non-relapse mortality was identical between uh, various conditioning types uh, for patients with ALL, um, as was the uh, relapse incidence for TBI versus busulfan, where tri but with triosulfan looking much worse. I had to dig into the supplements to find this, but I thought this was pretty important data. And that resulted in identical leukemia-free survivals um, between TBI and busulfan-based preps, with triosulfan looking much worse. So I also wondered, could TBI actually be worse than non-TBI in haplos? Um, and uh, we have some data preliminary generated by a really great fellow here at UCSF, Phil Powerstein, that suggests that TBI might be slowing down uh, T-cell immunologic recovery. So there was lots of great talks yesterday about T-cell reconstitution. Uh, the definition we used here was a CD4 count of greater than 200 with naive T-cells and a PHA response of greater than 50% of control. And um, you can see uh, that the no TBI patients had a, a somewhat faster uh, recovery of their functional T cells than the TBI recipients, despite there being no difference in acute graft versus host disease between these two groups. And I think very importantly, he did a landmark analysis of overall survival based on uh, functional T cell reconstitution um, in patients who survived to day 180. And you can see uh, really shockingly different uh, outcomes uh, based on this. So if, uh, in fact, uh, receiving a no TBI-based PrEP does improve your functional T-cell reconstitution, it may be associated with uh, better long-term survival in, um, in recipients. So in conclusion, with the caveat of relatively small numbers, uh, and this needs to be um, uh, obviously validated in other larger data sets and, and Dr. Paul Spurs and Abdel Azim are working on that. The strong allyl reactivity provided by alpha beta T cell depleted haplos suggests that TBI is really not required for optimal disease control in pediatric patients with ALL. I think this is especially true in the, those in very deep remission, but I was surprised to find that uh, even NGS MRD positive patients, flow negative, can have excellent outcomes with this approach. Uh, both melphalan-based, uh, as done in the onc 1401 trial, and busulfan-based regimens appear to provide uh, pretty similar relapse prevention to TBI. Um, right now, the data suggests that uh, triosulfan, which of course is not widely available in the U.S., should be used in caution. And again, if um, we can't ultimately eliminate TBI from our matched sibling mud transplants, I think this uh, would be a strong argument for doing upfront uh, alpha beta T cell depleted haplos for patients, um, even if they have a matched sibling or a 10 out of 10 MUD. I do want to thank um, 
uh, Mort Cowan, my mentor who did the first haplo on the West Coast uh, back in 1982, as well as other members of the UCSF BMT team, especially Sherman Backabak's uh, lab, who's uh, doing all the processing, Alicia for uh, lots of great discussions about uh, alpha beta and how to uh, improve our outcomes. And then Mike and Hisham for providing the, the data. And of course, um, that trial was funded by an R01 uh, led by Mike. Uh, and it was run at a bunch of different sites, as you see here on the right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for a great talk. Um, I would like to say to the audience to, to put their question in the chat. We have our final speaker, Matt Portius, um, from the Division of Stem Cell Transplantation Regenerative Medicine hematology oncology at Stanford, co-director of the Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine. Matt, take it from here. Thank you, Maria Grazia. Uh, thank you, uh, Alice and the entire team for organizing this symposia. Um, I was looking at the order of talks and I wasn't quite sure how mine was gonna fit in, but actually it fits in very well with the talk Chris just gave about the idea of um, enhancing a graft versus leukemia effect uh, post-transplant, but we, uh, in collaboration with Alice, I have thought about doing this by engineering the alpha beta T cells, and I'll tell you how we've done this in the preclinical work. Um, I have some conflicts with some biotech companies, but none are related to the work I'm, I'm presenting today. So as many of you know, um, my lab focuses um, on genome editing to engineer cells to give back to patients, and we're particularly, particularly interested in the idea of not just knocking out genes, but knocking in genes um, and not, and then for this talk, uh, uh, knocking in full genes and not uh, just creating a single point mutations. And the system that we use is uh, an ex vivo system in which we purify our cell of interest uh, for today. That's uh, T cells. Um, we put these cells in the cycle when the homologous recombination pathway is most active in S and G2. And then we deliver our nuclease. Uh, to make the break to simulate the uh, gene editing process. And we use CRISPR-Cas9 as a purified Cas9 protein complex to a synthetic guide molecule. We then deliver the donor template for the recombination process on an AV6. Uh, the advantage of using an AV6 uh, donor in this uh, setting is twofold. One is, is that AV has evolved a way to deliver uh, its single-stranded DNA cargo to the nucleus with uh, while uh, being minimally detected by the pathogen uh, sensing mechanisms in the cytoplasm. In addition, it'll, it, it allows us to not just create single nucleotide changes, but introduce um, cassettes of genes. So what we wanna do with this system is to add a new therapeutic function uh, to cells, so a form of synthetic biology. And we're gonna use the homologous recombination process um, to introduce one gene into another gene. And we built on the work that was published by Justin and Jorge in Michelle Satellane's lab several years ago, in which they used a very similar RMP AV6 system to knock a car into the track locus, the TCL, TCR receptor alpha locus. And up in the upper right hand corner is shown the schematic of doing that. And in the lower data shows that these um, knock in car T cells in their hands in using their models uh, had higher potency at lower cell doses than gamma retroviral engineered T cells. Uh, I think we will all admit now that um, this isn't always the case, but in principle now we uh, can knock the uh, car into the TCR. And in their case, they're using a 2A peptide. So it's being expressed as if it's a TCR. Um, so in collaboration with Alice and led by a former postdoc in the lab, Volker Wiebking, who's now a um, medical director at Genentech, we hypothesized that we could build on the alpha beta haploidentical uh, transplant platform as a way of potentially engineering for better post-transplant anti-leukemic uh, effects. And this was published in Hematologica in 2021. And the data is very uh, clear to this audience, and I feel a little bit embarrassed uh, stating it, but to summarize some basic principles, and again, uh, principles that uh, Chris just outlined, which is, is that 
if you can get from an MRD positive uh, situation to an MRD negative situation, you do better. And more importantly, if you can get from MRD negative uh, post-transplant, you do uh, the best, as, best of all. So one can think about then using CAR T cells as a way of inducing uh, MRD negative situations prior to the transplant. But what I'll focus on is how do we potentially enhance the graft versus leukemia post-transplant uh, to uh, generate higher frequencies of disease-free survival. And of course, the, the platform we're using is the uh, platform of depleting alpha, beta, and B cells, leaving behind NK cells and gamma delta cells. But what is, and using this, um, again, uh, Alice and Franco have shown that these types of transplants uh, are very effective and are as effective as match unrelated and mismatch unrelated donor transplants. But the... The idea here is, is that the alpha beta cells, which uh, get stuck on the column, um, can um, actually be knocked off the Milteni column and, uh, and then used to engineer a graft. And so the idea is to take advantage of what uh, Justin and Jorge did and take these normally discarded alpha beta cells and knock a car into the T cell receptor locus and maybe give these uh, engineered alpha beta cells back to the patient post-transplant. And the logic is that these alpha beta cells are from a healthy donor. So presumably uh, they have not been damaged by the chemotherapy that the patient has been exposed to, um, taking advantage of one of the concepts of allogeneic CAR T cells. But since the uh, recipient is gonna develop a T cell system derived from the donor, they also should not be rejected by the new donor immune system, either by the T cells or NK cells. However, one of the principles of the alpha beta haploidentical transplant is to give a minimal number of these T cells so that you do not cause GVHD. So our solution to this is again, to knock the car into the TCR to both give these alpha beta cells an anti-leukemic property while eliminating their GVHD uh, property. So um, again, we followed the approach that Justin and Jorge established and used a guide RNA to target exon one of the track locus and then knocked in a anti-CD19 car. We actually labeled the car uh, through um, a truncated nerve uh, or cells that had the knock-in car because they also would express a version of the truncated nerve growth factor receptor, a um, cell surface marker that is certain, cer essentially serves as a, a, a cell surface flag for us to both uh, measure and purify these cells if needed. The efficiency that Volker uh, established was uh, uh, tremendous in which he could uh, get a close to 80% uh, knock-in of the uh, CAR NGFR construct into the track locus, um, leaving behind just a small percentage of cells that would be uh, CD19, uh, I mean, sorry, would be TCR positive. And then we could further eliminate uh, those residual TCR positive cells from about a two to 4% level to less, uh, to approximately 0.02% um, by again, running the, the, the cells over an alpha beta depletion column. So now we have a population of cells that is 70% um, uh, CAR positive and less than or, you know, approximately 0.02% TCR positive. So do these uh, continue to have activity? Well, one sign of their activity is actually uh, they kill the residual B cells um, in the uh, TCR alpha beta depleted CD9 or uh, B cell depleted graft. And so after the cells have been engineered, um, it is only the cells that have the knock-in of the car in which we can see depletion of the residual CD19 positive cells from approximately uh, five to 9% to 0.5%. Uh, and it's perhaps this uh, in vitro stimulation that's allowing the cells uh, to remain active, even though we've taken the TCR off their surface. And then in vivo, um, using the NOM6 uh, model um, in NSG mice, uh, 
um, at a low dose of the CAR T cells, so 1 million uh, CAR T cells per mouse, you can see significant prolonga uh, prolongation of survival, whereas at a higher dose of these CAR T cells, the, the mice are completely cured with no evidence of a xenogeneic uh, graft-versus-host disease. So the key features then are that uh, as I've, uh, I've mentioned before, is, is we're engineering the cars from healthy T cells that are normally discarded. They're not going to be allogeneic re with respect to the new immune system post-transplant. They're engineered uh, to not cause GVHD, but they've also been engineered to retain an anti-leukemic potency. And so they have the potential then to enhance post-transplant uh, disease-free survival. The idea then, of course, is to, can we get bump this curve up by giving specific uh, CAR T cells uh, that are not GVHD causing. I'll note that because of the uh, low levels of TCR positivity, if we do that second purification step, one could deliver 50 million CAR T cells without exceeding the 10,000 per kilo alloreactive T cells that uh, we would like to stay below. This isn't even thinking about going to a, a dose level of 10 to the fifth. So what are our next steps? Um, the first is um, to, wor again, work with uh, uh, Liche and Milteni about thinking about how we can manufacture these in a closed system uh, process using the Milteni Prodigy. And we're excited to um, finally have all the equipment in place uh, to do this um, with uh, delays from COVID. But the other thing is being a, a bit optimistic and saying, well, this might work, but do you really want to create prolonged B-cell aplasia or a gamma globulinemia from these persistent CARs. So would it be uh, good to build in some sort of a mechanism to eliminate uh, these CAR T cells? And um, what uh, one could certainly use the uh, Bellicum safety switch, but what we uh, uh, are thinking that might be useful is to use uh, engineered oxytrophy. And what is um, engineered oxytrophy? It's basically using genome editing to engineer cells such they are they become dependent on a supplemental nutrient, uh, a, a benign nutrient that they depend on. And this was, again, work led by Volcker in collaboration with James Patterson. And the concept here is, is by using genome editing to knock out a enzyme in a metabolic pathway, the cells then become dependent on supplementing that metabolic pathway with the downstream uh, nutrient. And the pathway that James identified was to knock out uh, uridine monophosphate synthetase or UMPS um, and then supplement this pathway with downstream uridine. And the basis of this is actually that there are uh, rare uh, uh, patients in the world who don't have UMPS and they, uh, their uh, systemic defects can be rescued by supplementation of their diet by uridine triacetate. So there's a, a proof of concept in, in humans. Um, and so um, uh, Volker demonstrated that if he, in primary human T cells, if he, he could use genome editing to create UMPS knockout um, human T cells, and that if he supplemented the culture media with uridine, uh, these knockout T cells proliferated almost as well as wild type T cells. Um, but if you remove uridine uh, from the culture media, these T cells would no longer uh, proliferate. More importantly was, could you con control the engineered T cell product in an in vivo setting? And so what uh, Volker did is he created um, UMPS knockout T cells uh, selected for a population of cells that was entirely UMPS knocked out using an ex vivo um, selection strategy using 5-FOA. He then uh, transplanted uh, these T cells uh, into immunodeficient mice and gave these mice the uridine triacetate in their chow. And one can see that, um, and then after allowing engraftment, he randomized his mice to either mice that would continue to get uridine triacetate in their chow or would get um, a chow without uridine triacetate. And interestingly, one week after the randomization, you can see that a couple of the mice started to lose their uh, uh, T cells, although a couple of the mice continued to have high levels of T cells. But two weeks after the randomization, essentially all the T cells 
um, in the mice without getting the supplemental nutrient had disappeared. So in principle, then this gives us uh, a slow way of eliminating um, our T cells. So it's not a rapidly acting way. On the other hand, what I didn't show is it should be reversible. If you decide you want to keep your t cells around, um, you could reinstitute uh, uridine triacetate in the diet. And the risk of escape is very low because we have modified an endogenous metabolic pathway, the pathways the, the, the ways that a cell might escape this are gonna be very low. So um, in summary then, um, sorry, I'll go back. We think there's a, a possibility that we can combine engineering at the UMPS gene to generate nu nutrient oxytrophy with knocking in a uh, anti-leukemic car into the track locus as a way of supplementing uh, the alpha beta platform with a additional cellular therapy to increase the rate of cure without necessarily uh, creating long-term B cell aplasia. With that, I wanna thank uh, the organizers for uh, allowing us to present or allowing me to present this data on behalf of uh, Volker and our collaborators. Um, as uh, people know, this type of work takes a, a, a large team and a large community of people, including people in my own lab, funding from a number of different sources, support from the Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine, uh, fantastic collaborators at Stanford and academic collaborators around the world. Um, in this program, we haven't yet utilized our GMP facility, but we will soon. And to end, just give a shout out to um, uh, March uh, 2022, when we'll have our sixth annual symposia for the Center for Definitive and Curative Medicine. Thank you very much. And I hope we have time for a few questions. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for giving us the 10 minutes back. So we have <laughs> now 15 minutes for discussion. Wonderful. I can talk fast. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So um, we have one question in the chat, but maybe I wait a little bit longer to see if more are coming. And I ask you a question, Matt. So okay. in, in light of the recent news from allergen on the chromosomal yeah. uh, abnormalities or the cells engineer and the track logs, would you think that you um, first need to show that you don't have this chromosomal abnormality in vitro yeah. and second that the safety to go in the clinic will be a higher bar? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so what Maria Grazia is referring to in case uh, not everyone's familiar is Allogene is a company that is uh, engineering CAR T cells uh, from allogeneic CAR T cells in which knocking out the track, in, in their case, they're using talons um, so that they can do very similar things that I, I was describing. And recently their programs were put on hold um, because of the uh, identification of cells in a single patient that had a chromosomal abnormality, more details uh, need to be released, and we, we look forward to that. You know, it's interesting, Allogene, uh, which licensed the program from Pfizer, who licensed the program from Celexis, actually had a kill switch in their cars uh, at one point. Um, and so it really, I think, argues for the idea of having a regulatable um, way of controlling your cell product um, in case you need to eliminate it. Um, so, so that I think highlights that maybe those are necessary. And then as you're saying, of course, characterizing the cell product uh, before it goes into patients uh, for these types of chromosomal abnormalities will be important. And then monitoring them as they go along and then understanding the clonality or lack thereof of clonality of CAR-T therapies, I think are, is gonna be important. So. As, as any good research area is, is, is um, every new finding leads to interesting, uh, more interesting new questions. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of uh, compliments on the section and on the talks in the chat. We have also a question for Chris um, and a comment for Chris. So the question is from Michael Verneris. Uh, thank you for the nice talk, Chris. Was there a difference in age for the TBI versus no TBI and immune reconstitution analysis? Also, could there be a difference in conditioning intensity? And I read you also the comments because it's related to that. Brandon says, my thought is that TBI is more lymphodepleting than busulfan. So there may be 
uh, relatively more ATG left over at graft infusion, leading to essentially a functional higher doses of ATG. That's an interesting thought. Um, so I, we, yeah, we could measure that. Uh, we're starting to do ATG levels now, so we can get at that. Um, it's a, that's a great idea. Uh, as far as Mike's comment, thanks, Mike. Uh, we, I don't have that data sitting in front of me. I suspect that there's um, certainly very few kids in the, the very young uh, age range um, where in the TBI group, but the median is probably pretty similar because we've been using the, the melphalan based approach in basically all comers and transplant patients up to about 25 or so. Um, so I'll, well, we can formally look at it, but I don't think uh, there's going to be a huge uh, age difference. In terms of conditioning intensity, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. The vast majority of the non-TBI patients are the melphalan approach. Um, a couple patients got busulfan for various reasons, but it's mainly a mel versus TBI uh, data set. Thank you, Chris. And I actually have also a question for you. Do you think that the difference between the really nice data you present compared to the data presented by Franco is just related to graphalon versus thymoglobulin? I think that's gotta be a big part of it. I think there's such different agents and the timing so different that I, I that's my best guess as to why um, TBI may be more useful if, if there's not as, uh, if there's too much of an in vivo T cell depletion on day zero. And the other question I have uh, before I go back to the chat, do you think that the strong allure activity you see in the alpha beta depleted graft is mostly mediated by the NK cells or? <laughs> That's a great question that we need to look at. I, I do think uh, NKs are almost certainly important, but I suspect the gamma deltas may be equally important. Um, love to hear Alicia's thoughts on that. Well, I would say that um, when we move from the CD34 positive selection to the, to the alpha beta haplo depletion, we really ask this question as a, as a main question. And um, we, we, when we were doing the CD34 positive selection, we were having a pretty strict uh, hierarchy criteria to evaluate the donor, mostly based on the NK cell allure activity, because we knew that the NK cells were the only lymphoid cells we can count on for the first basically two months after the transplant, if not longer. So uh, in that cohort, we really saw a great advantage for both ALN and AML patients uh, when we were selecting the donor, while in the even in the set of the 80 uh, donors, uh, 80 patients, sorry, that we published in 2017 with Franco, there was no difference uh, between uh, donor picked for NK allure activity or not. So the way we interpreted this information was really that once is we are infusing mature NK cells with alpha beta depletion. So it might be that the presence immediate of these NK cells already able to express their uh, here and other ligands is more effective right away. But there are also the gamma data T cells, of course. And so uh, I, I would say that uh, it, we don't have data to say that one subset is more important than the other, but definitely is the combination of these two populations. So Alicia, since you have the floor, I ask you a question. Do you think that this approach to induce functional tolerance with the alpha beta in uh, solid organ transplantation, when you move from, you know, the, uh, the SIOD to cystinosis, you, you will get the same incidence of acute and chronic GVHD as we see in the hematological malignancy and other blood genetic diseases, or do you expect to see more? Well, that's a very good question, Maria Grazia. And I would say that uh, we need to consider that when we are going to transplant those patients, we are going to have two different variables. One which is pretty the same that we have an SIOD, which is the exposure to uh, dialysis for a number of years, 
probably the patients that we will transplant uh, will have SGS and uh, cystinosis will be older. And so uh, overall having a higher uh, risk of developing GHD. But on the other end, we cannot use the reduced toxicity conditioning regimen that we use for SIOD patients, because in that case, we have a completely normal marrow, but also a completely normal immune system. So we need a full immune uh, and myeloablation. And the combination of these drugs, of course, can lead to a higher risk of GHD. So we will need the, the, the safety part of this protocol will be incredibly important because, of course, we need to avoid life-threatening GHD. Yeah, thank you. So a question for Matt from Melissa. Uh, Matt, can you please elaborate on the real-world advantage of the approach of the nutrient versus the suicide gene? We just requires the addition of a medication when you want to eliminate the cells. And also, what are the safety implications for the slow uh, elimination versus the rapid elimination with the suicide gene? Yeah, thanks, Melissa, for the question. And, and I'll also answer Michael's, uh, Veneris' question about activated T cells can lose their dependence as well. Mm -hmm. um, so Melissa, the, the problem with in, uh, inter, introducing any suicide gene using a viral vector is some fraction of the integrants um, are going to get silenced. Um, and so you end up never having complete elimination of your product when you use uh, a viral integration of a suicide gene. That is just the nature of the process. Um, so in this case, uh, escape is gonna be uh, we think there's a decreased ability uh, to escape. I think the slow versus fast elimination, one could have a debate. We would anticipate that we don't need fast elimination um, because this is really just to stop having B cell aplasia. So you're not gonna turn that around overnight anyway. Um, I think what, what I mean by, uh, it goes to your new, the fact that these, uh, patients might have to take a, a, a medicine every day. I guess the advantage of the slow elimination is if somebody forgets to take their uridine triacetate one night um, or a couple days, they won't lose the graft because of uh, they forget to take uh, this nutrient. So that, that's why I think for this system, you don't want to have uh, something that would work fast. Um, Finally, Michael, you asked about activated T cells, lucid dependence. We have not looked um, at the various different T cell types, but I will point out that the uh, pathway we're inhibiting is dependent, um, well, basically it, it's a pathway in which you need to make uh, nucleotides. So we think actually any cell that needs to divide uh, won't be able to divide. I think the escape mechanism is cells that decide that they're not gonna divide and not be active. They might just sit there as zombies. Uh, we saw that in our some of our IPS teratoma work that uh, they'll stop dividing. So I think it's not the activated cells that might escape. It's probably the cells that become quiescent that might just sit around. Thank you, Matt. I see, Alicia, that you have a question. Yes, I would like to ask a question to Joseph, if possible, because I am really amazed by the data that you presented. I have to say, uh, I had the discussion about uh, how to transplant the severe aplastic anemia with alpha beta depleted transplant with many colleagues, uh, especially in Europe, because uh, when uh, Brigitte Sram was reviewing the, the protocol of the EWOG, uh, and we were writing a session about alternative donors. I, you know, honestly said in our paper, 20% uh, of graph failure in uh, with the alpha beta to sell the fetal haplo. So I, I, I'm not convinced it's the best strategy for this disease. Uh, the fact that you show these uh, uh, results are really, are really great. And I have two questions about, about your protocol. One is, uh, how long do you keep the cyclosporin post transplant? Uh, and how much do you think uh, do you impact that it does really impact in preventing the rejection? And second, um, the, the majority of the data you showed are on either 10 out of 10 or um, 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10 unrelated donors. Um, do you think that using a 5 out of 10 can make the difference in terms of risk of rejection? Uh, 
I have to say again, on another disease and specifically on Fanconi anemia, when we discussed with Agnieszka and Rajni, we had this conversation mostly because historically the T cell depletion on match unrelated donor or just one antigen mismatch was leading to a lower risk of GHD. But my opinion is always in that specific case, the incidence of GHD is so low in Fanconi anemia with a haplo transplant that there is no reason to go ask for an unrelated donor. And I'm always a little nervous when I don't, when I don't have a direct control on the, on the graft uh, because I'm always concerned to do not have enough cells. So I'm, I'm, I would be happy to hear your, your perspective. Sure. So for the first question um, with the cyclosporin, um, we start them on cyclosporin on day um, zero, day one, depending, and then um, switch them over to TAC on discharge from the hospital. And they stay on tacrolimus for... Um, six months is our preference. Some patients don't tolerate it and we pull them off, you know, within two to three months post-discharge. We have not seen any graph rejections when we pull them off the TAC. What we have seen is in the patients um, that come off the TAC early, some will have some autoimmune cytopenias once in a while, but they're, uh, you know, usually easily treated. Um, with respect to the unrelated donor versus the haplo, um, we did try two haplos off protocol with alpha beta T cell depletion and both of them rejected in our center. So that's why we, we really shy away from the haplo with alpha beta for aplastic anemia. They were both severe acquired aplastic anemia patients. And I, I don't know if it's because the antigen that the T cells are recognizing, you know, is, is some minor antigen that, that may be passed on from a family member and that may not be common in, in an unrelated donor. I, you know, I, I think until we understand the mechanism of the bone marrow aplasia, um, it's sort of hard to speculate why the haplo in particular is not engrafting as well. Um, but when we use the unrelated donors, we haven't had, thankfully, in both of our protocols, any graft projection. Um, so. Thank you, that's very helpful. So I have one final quick question, quick answer for Agnieszka. Agnieszka, when you see the field evolving for Fanconi anemia and MDS, do you think we would go to a full antibody conditioning and get away from you know, all the chemotherapy or you think that uh, would not be possible? I think that's really our goal, and I think it is possible. Um, uh, and whether it ends up being all antibody or some small molecule immune suppressants, um, uh, I, or some combination um, uh, of both, uh, I think that we will be able to get there and get rid of um, uh, uh, all chemotherapy and irradiation for Franconi um, uh, protocols. And then hopefully from there, expand that um, type of treatment um, uh, to many other uh, non-malignant diseases. I think in Fanconi anemia, the need is the greatest, um, uh, given these patients have such a high predisposition um, uh, to the development of malignancies. And so patients are particularly eager to sign up for studies um, uh, like ours um, uh, that don't have um, uh, or have decreased amounts of these agents. Um, but I think once we show uh, safety and efficacy uh, in this patient population, we're really hoping to expand to many other indications from here. Um, but we're taking an approach where we're decreasing one, one piece at a time. And I think the busulfan and the TBI is the worst um, uh, from these protocols. And so um, uh, that's the change that we're making initially. Um, but with time, hope to get rid of the cyclophosphamide and the food therapy as well. Thank you. Thank you all. This was a fantastic session, fantastic speakers, great discussion. Thank you so much. And now I give the floor to Tanya Gruber, who is going to introduce the closing keynote lecture. Tanya, take it from here. Thank you.